Well, good morning, everyone. This is Larry Wilkins with the ABA Engineering Academy, and um, we want to welcome you to our October edition of our engineering webinar. These uh, webinars are produced by the ABA Engineering Academy, and we uh, host these things of the third Tuesday of each month. So make sure you put that on your on your calendar. Each one of the webinars, we have uh, a special guest on that uh, talk about uh, uh, information that is of interest to broadcast engineers and uh, of interest to uh, quite often to pro audio people, the um, people that are involved in live audio and also in recording studios. So make sure that you mark the third Tuesday of each month for uh, these engineering webinars. The uh, the in, the webinar itself is underwritten by Max Connect. If you haven't checked into uh, this company, they make a nice little unit that will allow you to get audio from point A to point B uh, over the uh, using IP. So if you're not familiar with it, make sure that you check check them out at www.maxconnect.com. And I think our co-host is with us today, uh, John George. He's been uh, been staying down in Florida. I know he's enjoying the sun and the sand and the beaches <laughs> and all that. So uh, uh, how's everything uh, in your world, John? Well, everything's fine. It's good to be back in South Carolina for a couple of weeks. Nice, cool temperatures and uh, highs in the 70s and lows in the uh, 50s. Uh, but uh, as I always do, when we start off our session, we talk a little bit about some of the FCC rules and regulations and happenings going on. And of course, we're in October, which means we're in the fourth quarter of the year. And we want to remind everybody to be sure to do your quarterly tower light checks. And that includes a thorough inspection of all things tower lighting, uh, the lights, the, uh, which include the beacons and the side markers, all your monitoring equipment, and the testing of that monitoring equipment to ensure that if there is a failure, uh, that you absolutely have to, and of course the cat just joined me, uh, you have to uh, uh, be sure that those systems are functioning properly because the worst thing you want to have, have happen is a tower light fade, uh, a failure and not get a notification. The other thing that's going on right now, uh, due December the 1st, and a lot of you don't deal with this aspect, but uh, especially in the smaller markets, you might want to mention to the owners and managers, which are usually one of the same, that the biennial ownership report is due on September the 1st. There is a $75 filing fee for commercial stations and non-commercial stations, there is no filing fee. It's but uh, uh, 85 for commercial. Oh, I'm sorry. Thank you. $85 for commercials and non-commercial stations are free. Um, this is a fairly complex report. Uh, it's one that a lot of people can do themselves, but uh, uh, you might want to consider having your legal counsel uh, uh, that specializes in communications law uh, complete that report because there are some uh, particular parts of that form that uh, are required to be answered in a very specific way and you don't want to get yourself into uh, a problem there by uh, answering no when it should be yes or yes when it should be no. But uh, those are the major things uh, going on. Uh, Georgia Association of Broadcasters will hold their GABCOM, which is Georgia Communications this weekend, that is their annual meeting, uh, very much like the Alabama Association of Broadcasters annual meeting. And that will be Saturday. There will be an S, uh, SBE Annis Foundation uh, seminar all day Saturday, starting at 9.30. Uh, advanced registration has closed, but I'm sure they will gladly accept any walk-ups if you want to drive over to Atlanta and you're in the area and participate in that. That'll be on Saturday the 23rd. And that's all I've got, Larry. Okay, good. And good to have you with us today. Sometimes you're you're flying or driving or laying on the beach and we can't. <laughs> yeah, well, I don't know about laying on the beach. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, as we said at the beginning, at each one of our engineering webinars, we have special guests on to talk about uh, subjects that uh, they are familiar with and uh, have all the information. And one of the things we got to looking at the other day was that uh, with the pandemic going on, engineers have really been stretched to the uh, limit trying to keep their stations operating as close to normal as possible. And most often things are happening 
uh, outside of the station, no longer happening there at the, uh, at the studio itself. So we invited uh, some people here with us. So glad to have them with us from Thailand, Doug Ferber and Jacob Daniluk. And to start out with, I think, Doug, um, you guys have probably been right at the forefront of trying to help stations figure out how to keep things going in some similar uh, fashion. Is that correct? Well, as the, as the insurance commercial goes, uh, we know a few things because we've seen a few things. Um, so yeah, we're we're helping uh, people fight the fight on the front lines, and uh, it's been crazy at times uh, because it's uh, been a scramble, and it's kind of come and go and come back, and and uh, it uh, it's now kind of the new normal, uh, and uh, I will get into it here in a little bit, but uh, yeah, it's been a little nutty out there. Uh, and the logistics part of it has not made it easy for you guys either. And I will tell you up front that uh, it's been heroic what uh, the engineers have done um, to keep their stations on the air. So um, we're giving you a big high five right now for, for doing all that. So, um, and uh, one of the guys that's kind of, uh, uh, he's my, my kind of partner in crime here, Jacob, he's our, uh, tech sales expert for the Americas. And uh, he's been with Tyline now for 11 and a half years, Jake. Is that right? Yeah. Um, yep. Um, so he, he knows the codec and audio world IP uh, as well or better than anybody. And I think he's the best guy on this side of the planet because on the other side of the planet is our headquarters in uh, Australia. So having said that, um, uh, Larry, do you have any other questions before we begin, or, or uh, should we just let it roll? No, we'll let it roll. Uh, if anybody has uh, any questions they would like to ask our, our presenters, just uh, type a message down in the uh, chat menu, and they can see it, and uh, we can see it as well, and share and, and answer any of your questions on there. So y'all just take it away and, mm -hmm. and tell us how you're helping stations out. Or just stop us, because this is a pretty small group. So um it it uh, it's a little bit more intimate. You could just stop us, and we can figure out what, where where we where we should go back to. Okay. I will tell you that um, we're going to draw for a, uh, a Amazon gift card at the end of the presentation. So um, I know there's somebody out there with an eight four three call in number. I don't know who you are out there, but if you want to be in the drawing, please uh, uh, shout out your name, and I'll put it on a little piece of paper here. So. Um, Okay, so uh, this is a presentation we did for the, uh, the Texas Broadcasters Conference uh, in August. Believe it or not, there was a little window there in the summer where uh, conferences were happening and Texas was one of them. And uh, it literally it was on August 3rd and if it were on August 10th, it would not have taken place because it was right before the variant uh, kind of took hold. But uh, we, we named it Surviving Bro uh, Remote Broadcasting Dur pan During a Pandemic uh, sub uh, uh, title. I told you we would use that old codec as a backup someday. So, um, you know, the, uh, and I'll get into what that means here in, in a minute. So Jake, if, if you'll uh, get us started. So uh, in reflecting over the last 18 months now, we just hope everybody's okay. Um, you know, uh, we appreciate uh, the doctors and nurses and, and on the front line. You talk, Larry, you talked about front line a minute ago. It literally is a front line. And uh, we hope you're staying safe and been able to uh, dodge the virus. Jacob? So two key takeaways from the last 18 months. And, and we did this presentation with uh, Town Square Media and Brian Broadcasting. Uh, Brian Broadcasting, some of you may know Ben Hill. Uh, from Bryan College Station. Um, they've got a pretty big operation in, in uh, kind of a medium to small size market. So we thought that would be a, a, a good comparison. The, the smaller markets were more affected than the bigger markets were um, in terms of um, uh, remote stuff. Um, broadcasters have learned to adapt to a new reality of doing more remotely. Um, the public's perception of professional broadcasters has brought to light how important it is to be connected to the audience. So there's a new normal now. Jake? 
how do you remote effectively? Uh, the tools are out there and it can be done with any budget. Um, most expensive isn't always the best way to go, depending on kind of who you are and what your needs are, even though we do sell the most uh, expensive equipment. But um, the main thing to remember is that your hosts know what works for them and what doesn't. Jacob? So how one company made it work, and this is Tan Square Media. Uh, when the pandemic first started causing business to close, it was imperative to get a working solution in place. Every, every host was given a piece of equipment to be able to operate from home. It's included high quality, dedicated AYP equipment, as well as free solutions like uh, clean feed and Skype. But that sorry we're closed sign was on the front door of the, of the main studio building. Um, at the studio end, uh, the town square engineers worked to ensure connectivity to switchers and, out, and routers to make sure that the remote audio got to its destination. And now with the return to a level of normalcy, normalcy, many of those solutions have turned into permanent means of making radio work more efficient and more personal. The, more and more companies, radio, broadcasting, television, uh, any industry, name it, um, uh, it's not gonna be the same when, when things are kind of quote unquote normal again. Jake? So hosts are now more comfortable with uh, doing their shows from other locations since infrastructure was created to get them through the pandemic. And now the question becomes, how do operators take the lessons of the last 18 months and create a more comprehensive and budget-friendly method of broadcasting in the years to come? Because it's not going away. Um, created an unprecedented challenge for radio, forced social distancing, uh, contingency plans allowing station talent to stay safe and go live on the air, and voice track remotely from home. Um, literally, we ran out of the main studios like there was a, um, a zombie apocalypse. Um, virtualization was forced upon the industry. Uh, uh, the goal was to minimize the disruption. And the worst thing about it was that you guys, the engineers, had limited access to your studios. Jake? So how did workflows change? Um, it depended at the time um, and still kind of where you are. The, the hotspots, this, this is an old map um, from about a year ago, but um, that map has totally changed. Now the hotspots are in the upper uh, Midwest in um, Montana, Idaho, Wyoming. Uh, the hotspots from a couple of months ago, like Louisiana and Florida, in Georgia and, and Alabama, Mississippi, are not quite as hot as they were before, getting better. I'm sure you guys have seen it. So um, the workflows have changed depending on the, the heat of the, of the virus. In the small markets, um, uh, remote markets have very low numbers of COVID cases. There's been less need to work remotely, although that is changing again. Uh, fewer employees and lower ge general population density some disruption with workflows, but not near as much as everywhere else. Unless, of course, you have a big university, a meatpacking company, or a coal mine in your market. This is a photo of Grand Island, Nebraska. Um, they got hit really hard. That is a, 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 a market of three counties, 60,000 people. Not, not a lot of population there. But because they've got one of the biggest meatpacking uh, facilities in the country with a lot of people working closely in proximity, um, uh, the, the spread of the virus went crazy there. Coal mines, same thing, universities, a petri dish. Jake? In larger markets, uh, the virus has been very disruptive. Main studio automation was put to the test. Uh, talent, uh, broadcasting live and voice tracking from living room studios. Everything was ad hoc there for a while. Now it's getting a little bit more professional. Um, you guys, the engineers, were the only ones left in the building. Um, and it's in a lot of cases, it's still that way. Um, you scrambled to keep the live content on the air. And we will tell you that we have only found one company that was prepared for this. Um, uh, 
Uh, solutions range from or range from cheap short-term fixes to high-quality long-term setups, and Jacob's going to get into that in a few minutes. Jake. So you you guys were forced to test the uh, the viability of remotely producing your content, um, and even though remote broadcasting was not new to the radio industry before the pandemic. Um, a lot of companies are still caught with their pants down. Um, engineers and IT professionals put together low cost and low quality solutions as a fast fix. Many were also now working from home. Uh, the number of hardware codecs on hand was a lot less than what was needed. Um, many use lower quality software solutions. Not that they're bad, but they're just lower quality. Um, the longer talent broadcasts from home, the greater the need for better remote equipment. And we're going to show you reasons why, in a, in a, in a little while, why there's going to be a need for more uh, permanent, uh, higher quality equipment. Uh, but back in, in the day when this was like really crazy, um, you guys found ways to smooth out the roughness of the short term fixes through creative necessity and higher quality equipment acquisition. And I, and I st uh, stress the creative necessity. Um, it, it, was, it was nuts what, what uh, some of you were going through to keep your stations live and local. Overall, um, management's happy with the results of the test. Um, and that, that means uh, change is probably gonna come permanently. So Jake, let's move on to the next one. So one of the early conversations we had about this was with uh, the intercom then, Odyssey Now, guys in uh, San Diego. Um, and uh, the way that they described the, what they thought was gonna be a temporary thing to their on-air staff was that it's gonna be just like camping. Um, in, uh, in many cases, uh, uh, near 100% of the staff was still working from home. Yeah, I'm stuck here. Uh, we're still working from home. You know, you could hear the, the birds outside, the lawnmowers, the dogs barking, the, the Amazon guy ringing the doorbell, um, emergency vehicles, uh, audio drops, late audio, audio delivery, and subpar acoustics. Um, literally, people were broadcasting from their closets because it, the, the clothes on each side muffled all the sound. Uh, so it doesn't matter. Well, yeah, um, it does. But in the beginning, some seem to think that a rough production makes their show sound a little bit more real, a little bit more local. Uh, it was okay for a little while, but the jocks were getting frustrated with the drops and the delays and all that. The listeners hear it and they push a button, go to another station. Um, um, so cute in the beginning, but sloppy you know, if it lasts too long. So with that, I'm gonna hand it over to Jacob to kind of take you through um, uh, the different types of solutions, the, the kind of the, 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 the gamut, if you will, of software, hardware, hybrid solutions, as well as kind of how the sports guys did it uh, on the professional, collegiate and high school level. So Jake, take it away. Yeah. Thanks, Doug, and uh, thanks, guys, for letting us chat with you today. Um, so a couple of things to note um, would be that the, exactly how did engineers that we've noticed go about tackling these tasks? Um, first off, the ones that had a full AOIP infrastructure already had a leg up on most people with analog or even AES3 systems that have not adopted AOIP yet in terms of audio codecs. Um, the reason for this is because POTS lines and ISDN lines to install that in somebody's home um, is almost impossible these days. And I'm talking about a pure analog POTS line or a BRI ISDN line. Um, so AOIP, if you already had it, you were much better off already. Um, and the reason for this is because of the flexibility that AOIP offers or um, audio over IP. We're able to maintain uh, high density codecs, meaning we can do multiple inbound and outbound streams, et cetera, with 
um, audio over IP equipment. The other big thing that helped engineers and management um, adopt this mindset of moving studios to a home environment uh, for talent to work with was mainly from the disposal of the main studio role. Um, We saw a lot of that, iHeart's adopting that, a few others are adopting that globally. Um, And the idea of moving outbound to home studios is much more feasible with that. Um, The other big thing that we noticed is, and this hints the title um, of our presentation is, we saw stations pulling out old, old Kodak equipment. Um, And a lot of them kept preaching for years. You should never get rid of your remote equipment if it still works. There is always a time to upgrade it, get more modern equipment that can be much more stable. But is there anything wrong with uh, a codec that was made in the 2000s? In the early 2000s, that's an IP codec. Typically not. If there's no hardware faults, it will still operate. It just won't be as reliable or as robust in the long run. Um, But essentially, these these home broadcast solutions were done in essentially three steps um, that we saw. Um, Engineers would design and implement a process to uh, deploy that system. Then they would also send, or as the next step, they would gather all the equipment and send the equipment home to the DJs, um, or with the DJs, I should say. And then lastly, they would... provide instructions for the DJs on how to configure the equipment. Some did this, some just took the step of, and they took the risk themselves of installing it and configuring it themselves. Um, So you have a little bit of a process there to get going with these home studios, but it is certainly doable. Now, some of the hurdles that you would find with having another hop in your entire infrastructure because that's essentially what we're doing. We're going from your home studio to your main studio, from your main studio to your towers. We have added another hop there. Um, You'll see higher levels of latency going all the way to the tower. So it's harder for the talent to monitor an on-air feed uh, through the radio, et cetera. So you need to provide that low latency IFB link through the codec. The other thing that uh, a lot of engineers ran into issues with is they wanted better control Um, to manipulate that equipment in those home studios. And that required firewall manipulation at the home studio level. Um, Sometimes this works out easily. Sometimes it's a nightmare depending on your ISP or I should say that talents ISP. Um, So those were the two big things that we kept running into. And there are ways to overcome both the higher latencies and the firewall issues, depending on what codecs you go with or what solutions you're using. Um, But here are some general ideas of what we have found to be those categories. And we have broken it up into four categories in total. The first is software solutions. Um, If you have old PCs lying around, old laptops, old desktops, why get rid of it? It still has some use somewhere and a software codec could be one of those. Um, And you're hearing this being preached from a hardware manufacturer that it is doable There are some pros to it, like it's typically cheaper, more inexpensive to set up, and you can use spare hardware you have lying around. However, though, there are some cons from our perspective to a software-based solution. Um, The one of them might be like audio quality, as an example. That's going to be based off of the hardware you're using. The reason for that is because it could have a low end audio input or output device. It could have a high pass filter in it that could limit the frequency response of the audio throughput um, back to the studio. Performance can be hindered in software based solutions. Um, And what I mean by this is all it takes is, especially if you're running Windows, the dreaded Windows update to come into play. If it starts going in the background, it's going to take away some CPU cycles from everything else. Do we want that to happen? Typically, no, um, because that can hinder performance in the long run. Um, Same way with other things that could run in the background, like virus scans, um, other software updates, um, or other miscellaneous tasks that that PC has been programmed to do. Latency-wise, can be higher 
because we are using an x86 platform instead of a dedicated hardware design like a DSP system. Um, so latency can be higher depending on what CPU and what architecture is specific or specifically you are running. Um, technical support, it depends. Um, it's either you're going to either have it in some limited format or maybe through a paid service, or you might not have technical support at all. And you are relying now on the community as a whole. Um, that can work if you're okay with dealing with those issues. Uh, you might have um, additional software. Um, that may be needed to control things. And you also might have to have additional training for the talent, um, or you might have to put remote software on this PC. So there are several things that uh, you would want to look at. The last point about software is network redundancy. That is up to the hardware itself, typically. Um, the hardware has to support it. And then the software itself, depending on how network redundancy is handled, the software itself may have to do that too. Um, and out of the ones that we've mentioned here, at least pictured, um, not a lot of these actually offer real-time uh, true packet replication uh, redundancy that um, you might find in hardware products. The other type of product you uh, would find that could handle and accomplish this task of getting that home studio audio to this main studio is through a phone hybrid. Um, some of you might already know of this and are doing it, and that's fine. It is a better solution than software, in my opinion. Um, it gives you more dedicated uh, resources at the studio at each end. Um, they're fairly straightforward to configure, um, typically, even if it's a VoIP uh, phone hybrid, one using a SIP system. Um, it's typically cheaper than a full-blown hardware co uh, audio codec. Um, it does require phone lines at both sides, which is one of the cons to it. Um, then quality is going to be limited. Now, if you have two VoIP uh, hybrids, you might get better uh, like HD voice quality through it. So it will sound better. Um, but all it takes is one phone line or one POTS or PSTN line um, to bring that back down to a phone line audio quality. Um, so we are not getting full fidelity across hybrids um, that we could with like a audio codec. Now, the next category is one we kind of put together because it's kind of a hybrid. You'll find dedicated hardware and also software. So we call it a hybrid codec or a hybrid codec app solution. Um, these you would see like uh, we would classify like Tylines Report It, Lucy Live, or even the Comrex Opal is this because they, they all require some form of hardware, um, but they also have software implementations too. Um, these are typically lower entry, lower cost um, solutions. Uh, they work out for, and they work out very well, typically. Um, they do require a mobile device or a PC on one end, and then that dedicated hardware back at the studio. Uh, setup is typically fairly minimal, um, and it typically doesn't require much effort. Now, there are some cons to this, depending on the solution you choose. You may need to register a domain name or an SSL certificate for the end of device itself. So that way it can actually uh, have a more secure connection to it. Um, and you, it also gives you guarantees that that is the device you're connecting with. The other thing you might have to worry about is third-party protocols. Some of these hybrid solutions or codec hybrid solutions do... Uh, you rely on third-party protocols. Um, as an example, like WebRTC is, um, is a great one. It relies on Apple, Google, and Microsoft and a few others to maintain that software. You can view that as a good thing or a bad thing. The way we view it is that we are now relying and putting our eggs in the basket of Apple, Google, and Microsoft and the proper manufacturer of the hardware. All of those people must essentially collaborate and make sure all the updates are happening simultaneously. So that way we never have an issue with compatibility. Um, that's putting a lot of eggs into one basket, in my opinion, with four different companies potentially. 
Audio quality um, is going to be dependent on the hardware and the field itself. Um, if you have a low-end Android phone using one of these solutions and then maybe an iPhone, the quality between the two will be vastly different. Um, iPhone has a very good microphone where some Androids don't focus on the audio input. They might focus on the return audio or they might focus on the processing power of that phone. Not all phones are created equal is the idea here. And then the reliability is based off of the manufacturer's implementation of a redundancy protocol. Um, so like with Report It, you're going to find that we've implemented our Smart Stream Plus technology. That is a true packet replication protocol. But then if we look at uh, some of the other protocols, like Lucy as an example, they use primarily SIP or RTP. Well, they have to embed their own version of redundancy into either of those to make it function. Now, if they try to do that with SIP, there's only limited ways they could do it to still make it interoperable with other products. Um, so it's much more limited in how we can do interoperability unless the manufacturer takes the time to design that and implement that in a proprietary manner in these formats. But now the, the, the big category for us as we are a hardware manufacturer is hardware audio codecs. Um, you'll find that we have a lot of things that we can offer out in the field. Um, we can offer dedicated hardware that's designed for point A to point B transmissions. Um, it is purpose built for that. Um, we, we design the product with high quality, high fidelity audio in mind. So that way we're able to not only guarantee you a good quality link and maybe a good quality compression algorithm, but we can also guarantee you that the audio IO itself will maintain and listen and respond to those, uh, to that frequency that we're working with. Um, you'll find a wide range of compressions available in hardware codecs like AAC, Opus, MP2, MP3, um, linear, uh, enhanced Aptex, et cetera. So you'll find not only just open source algorithms, but you'll also find licensed algorithms too that require royalties that the manufacturer takes care of on the back end, like with AAC or MP3, um, or even the enhanced Aptex license. Network redundancy and load balancing are designed in the hardware itself. Um, so that way, you don't have to worry about setting up a third-party service with like a PC software, as an example. Um, so it's all built right in, ready to be used at a moment's notice. Then the other big thing is remote management of these devices. Um, you don't have to worry about any third-party subscriptions for remote access, typically, um, unless you want to go to that extent. Um, but as long as you know the IP address, typically, of a remote codec, you're able to control it still. Now, how far of control can you go? Will depend on the manufacturer themselves. Or if you're able to even access it through that firewall will depend on your firewall capabilities. But remote management is there available in that codec. It just depends on how you deal with it and how you manage it. Um, there are some, there's one con that we can think of immediately with audio codecs, um, with hardware audio codecs, that's the pricing. Um, they're typically more expensive than like a phone hybrid or a software solution. Um, but the big difference here is that this is an on-premise, uh, you own it device. So you're not paying a service subscription fee to maintain the hardware itself typically. Um, so once you buy it, you've invested in that and it's going to work for you for years to come where uh, some of those other solutions might be more annual subscription based and they may not be on-premise solutions it could be cloud-based which could add a whole nother world of uh, issues now some of the with that in mind with those solutions let's kind of look at how some different teams um, handled things um, so doug remind me again who who, who is this, this is this is eric nadell He's the uh, radio voice of the Texas Rangers. And if you believe that every picture tells a story, the one on the lower left will show you how frustrated he is with the setup. And uh, I know Eric personally, and he did he was not happy about, you know, uh, broadcasting the away games from the, the press box, but with um, just from a TV screen. 
Mm-hmm. Um, you know, it. Um, they were very glad to get back on the road. And um, but he's, you know, he's been doing this for 30, 40 years, and you can see in his face how frustrated he was. So that's kind of typical of of uh, kind of the frustration of, of, of what everybody's been experiencing. Yeah. So, and as you can see right here, yes, in his case, he is live from a press box, but not always. Um, they are typically quarantined themselves either at the stadium or they might even be at home pulling a home feed uh, to their uh, home studios. Um, you might see an, an uh, sorry analysts and hosts and sideline reporters all in different locations, never all together at once, typically during a pandemic like this. Um, and then travel, as Doug said, it's limited or it's non-existent, unfortunately. There are still about a half a dozen NFL teams that are not traveling to the away games with their teams. Mm-hmm. And, and they're not traveling on the team plane. They're traveling yeah. commercial. Yeah, so it's definitely impacted play by play um, for sure. And this is just one example of play by play in the world of sports and the world of remotes. Another um, great example would be um, the Houston Texans here. Um, as the NFL keeps making changes on them, um, things are having to, they're having to adjust. One of the very first things that they noticed right at around March was they had very lim- limited access to the actual stadium itself and to NRG. Um, they weren't allowed in the press box at all. Um, they had to broadcast from different suites at the stadium, even if it was a away game because they did not travel with the team. Um, and some of their engineers just having to work with their talent actually got exposed to COVID. So they had to deal with several things, um, on their end, um, that being one of them. Um, and while they were exposed, they actually exposed the equipment. And you might be thinking, well, it's one thing to have an exposed engineer, you quarantine him. But have you ever thought about quarantining your equipment? Because according to studies, COVID can survive on surfaces for a little while. It's unclear exactly how long, but it is doable um, for them to survive. So do you really want to expose the next person? So you might want to think about cleaning apparatuses or or taking the time to actually um, sanitize all of your equipment as it comes back in from the field. Um, and then something else that the Texans, um, took advantage of because the fact that they were moving around from different suite to suite each week where they didn't know where all the TVs were going to be set up and and how they were going to be set up each week. Uh, they decided to, instead of getting studio equipment uh, or studio codex, they actually opted to get two field codex instead. Um, so that way they can have one in the field on the go, um, specifically for their sideline reporter then the other codec was actually going to be used to receive that at NRG Stadium. So that way the host um, and the main talent can actually talk to that sideline reporter who traveled with the team. Um, so this is another example of what, as I said, the Texans did. One, um, one, one another professional sports anecdote. Um, if you're familiar with uh, John Sterling, who's the play-by-play guy for the Yankees, he actually called the same play twice because – um, it was an instant replay that he was watching on a screen. So he, he called the same home run call two different times um, because he was work, not working live. Yeah. Well, he's working so, live, but, but from a television screen. Yeah, and, and you'll definitely find that that can create a challenge because that's something that Brian Broadcasting actually ran into a little bit. Um, what they found is as a best result, they found pulling a real-time video feed with multiple camera angles from a network uh, could produce them a clean stereo um, effect um, for their main broadcast feed, but it also allowed their talent to actually monitor and watch the game and broadcast the game. But that's with multiple camera feeds. Um, The next best thing they found was having a single camera feed with surround sound to actually get uh, a better audio signal but still have that main visual focus um, there. It worked very well for their broadcasts. Um, however, until they went to the internet stream specifically, that's when things started to break up a little bit more and it became harder for those talents to actually broadcast the game through a visual reference through essentially through a TV monitor. Um, 
And then finally, when everything just fell apart for Brian, they had backup plans in place. Um, and they essentially, I don't know where mine is, but they just pulled out their iPhone and did a FaceTime. It works. It, it is a means of a backup. There are pros and cons to it. Brian Broadcasting, been over there. They understand those and they know that that's going to be my worst case scenario. And occasionally they did have to go that route. Um, he even talked about with us at one game, all they had to show to everybody were the stats. Um, and that's all they had to go with. Um, and they made it work. Um, so you might run into things like that um, in another instance of a pandemic. Um, the other big thing uh, to note is that like for Brian Broadcasting, they opted to not do live sideline um, interviews or post-game interviews. They actually did that all pre-recorded, um, either through available apps. Um, like as an example, the reported app would be one. There are others that could do pre-recorded interviews for you easily. Um, or they would just end up having that person call into the studio via a phone hybrid. And then they would do it back and forth with the person in the studio and record it that way. So there are several things you could do, and it's just a matter of working with those organizations like the NFL or the local high schools to actually see, or I should say also local colleges, to see exactly what they would let you do um, and try to make the best of it. As Brian Broadcasting did, they just resorted to video feeds like the NFL had to. Now, there was another use case Brian Broadcasting had, and that's about high school sports. Um, they had a little bit more freedom with high school sports. They were allowed to travel. Um, and what they ended up doing was essentially a, a combination of full codecs, mixers, consumer grade pro, um, or sorry, prosumer uh, grade codecs, um, PCs, and portable mixers. Um, they used a little bit of everything. Um, they did try to do fall and spring sports with the best gear possible. Well, they had split uh, schedules, so that allowed them to, to mm -hmm. they weren't overwhelmed in the fall. They yeah. Were able to, they, so they, they could employ their good equipment um, or the best alternatives uh, in each of the seasons, spring and fall. Yeah, so that way that equipment was focused on like the mission, mission critical events or the, those crucial remotes that they just wanted to make sure had that perfect audio quality all the time. Um, they were able to travel with uh, a lot of the high school teams, um, which was good. However, though, they weren't always allowed in the broadcast booths. Um, so a lot of times they did have to actually set up outside in the stands with the crowd itself, um, which depending on, again, who you ask, some might say that's more personal some might say it is sloppy um our vote is it, it will tend to get sloppier if it continues long um, and you don't bother to do anything about it with processing those crowd effects etc to tone those down um, the other big thing that they realized was battery backups it's great to have all these different backups in place for the audio link itself by having your audio codex, then maybe FaceTime, and then maybe Skype or even a regular phone hybrid as backups, but never forget about power. Um, Brian Broadcasting learned that very quickly that a battery backup is a great thing to have for remotes. So just to throw that out there um, for you guys. Now, some of the things that they did have to do occasionally with high schools was like watch the NFHS feeds. Um, so that way they weren't necessarily there all the time, but they were out there with the teams most of the time they told us. Um, they did have to use a mix of uh, radios and direct line outs from mixers to send to video feeds as well for video streaming services to feed to N NFHS systems or to other streaming services like YouTube or Twitch or some of the others out there. So they were able to incorporate all of that into one single system instead of having that split across two different systems with just... Uh, uh, two different mixers, et cetera, for two different audio feeds. They were able to combine their radio with the TV side of it very easily. Um, and the 
Rode audio, they actually opted not to do crowd microphones just because it created less hassle for the talent out in the field and they didn't have to worry about setup and configuration. Um, so they didn't really worry about crowd noise too much, but you still have that, of course, that uh, background noise through just the traditional microphones themselves, unless you decide to process that out. Um, and then well, I'll, I'll take it from here, Jake. Fair <laughs> enough. Um, so give you give your voice a rest for a few minutes. Thank you, sir. Um, so um, the new normal remote broadcasting ain't going away, as we said earlier. Um, so from an employee standpoint, uh, what seemed to be a temporary challenge may be permanent. Um, uh, a lot of people don't want to commute. Um, they don't want to be in crowded elevators. Uh, they're fearful of unsanitized work areas. I mean, down to touching the buttons on an elevator. Um, uh, mask up, you know, who knows what the CDC is going to tell us about that. Um, but uh, uh, overall, they want the freedom of working in a comfortable home environment uh, uh, in a lot of cases. Jake? Uh, there's been a, a great resignation wave. Um, 25 to 40, and you've probably heard this on the news, but 25 to 40% of workers, I think, end up quitting their jobs. Um, the human resources people are just, they don't know what to do in a lot of cases. They're having to rewrite their, their employee manuals. Uh, employer, employees are asking if they can work fewer hours with more flexibility to create more personal time. So they've well, people have spent a lot of time at home and uh, a lot of folks liked it. Um, uh, some have quit because the company won't let them work from home post COVID. Um, some miss their offices, but their companies are now hybrid or all remote. And what they find in a lot of cases is that it's not the same environment that they left in March of 2020. Um, some people are switching their careers entirely. Um, not much you can do about this. Somebody doesn't want to work at a radio station anymore. They, you know, they're not coming back. Um, the boss and HR may be able to retain some by offering uh, more flexibility. Um, so um, from the company's point of view, um, economists say that a third of the of US jobs could be done remotely. Um, for radio, fewer people in the studio means stations don't need all the space they currently occupy. So I, the, uh, the kitchen, or the jock lounge is probably going the way of the dinosaur. Um, in big markets, commercial office space and high visibility buildings where stations like to operate, uh, that, that commercial real estate leases for a hundred bucks a foot or more. So when you do the math, um, an industry that was already trying to save its bacon, um, We'll see this as an easy way to lower operating expenses. It's already happening. iHeart's doing it. Um, Univision has um, uh, reduced their footprint in a lot of places. Um, you're going to see more and more of this. Um, the remote equipment works great. The jocks like working from home, especially the single parents, and the GM gets to run the place leaner. And you're going to see a lot of rooms like this picture in the bottom of, of the slide um, uh, with no furniture in it um, until they can convince or get out of their lease and, or reduce the size of the main studio. Um, uh, Jake, so what will be the, the role of the main studio? A centralized location for technical infrastructure, a, plus, a place for guest interviews, uh, although there'll probably be fewer, more, fewer, fewer of them, uh, a place to update systems to broadcast from remote locations, um, it's going to be a central hub of, of, of equipment, uh, which will be actually less equipment too, because the consolidation is also going to be one of the next steps. Um, a place to prepare for prepare today for a similar emergency. Um, and you should plan now um, for the possibility of adding new air talent from anywhere using IP. Jake? So features of, of the future main studio, smaller, less guest centric. You're not gonna see those big tables with, with five microphone arms and all that. 
as much as uh, you, you have seen in the past. It'll be modular, so it's scalable or not, so you can make it smaller. Expanded use of the cloud for all functional areas. Uh, high degree of flexibility and the ability to switch to remote on demand. So really more support for remote contribution is gonna be um, a key going forward. Jake? So what's next? Investment in better remote equipment, we think. We're already seeing it. Uh, more hardware will be installed in home studios and in stadiums. The, the in-stadium thing is slow to catch up. Um, the, um, uh, and that's because of the, the pandemic. Um, the company that was doing the backhaul for, for all the NFL stadiums uh, uh, went belly up and they're using a very primitive system right now. Um, robust all-in-one solutions that stream, record, edit, and play audio from several sources. Some from other remote locations would be the most popular. Overall, I think you can expect to see uh, an increase in audio quality for all remote uh, of remote solutions. Jake? So we, as we've done this, presentation really over the last 18 months, um, uh, we have uh, heard kind of a wish list of, of equipment from, from guys like you. Um, and this is not necessarily in the order of importance. It's kind of a just casual um, survey, if you will. But what we've heard is that um, there's, the wish list includes multiple IP network co connection options for quality and redundancy, configurable audio routing, onboard audio processing. And that, that's really to create more of that uh, um, te uh, telecodec conferencing thing to bring in multiple people at the same time um, and, and handle the mixed minus. Uh, separate internet internal feedback channels. Um, but what we think is gonna be most important just from our casual questioning is ease of use. Um, because, you know, the talent isn't always technically savvy or confident. So um, the, the technology has to be easy to use. Um, and the ability to control it remotely um, is going to be more and more important. Think about this. Um, you guys have been now kind of been asked to manage probably five or 10 times as many studio locations because of all the remote setups that you did in the past. So a robust solution providing native level access to automation systems and the hardware equipment on site and remote, at a remote site is gonna be very, very important because you just can't cover 15 locations um, in, at a time without a little bit of technical help. Jake? So the byproducts of forced remote broadcasting, uh, expanded use of telecodec conferencing, I mentioned that in the past, you know, uh, um, having the mix minus done uh, natively in, a, in, a, uh, in, a, in, in hardware. Um, talent working from home will have to be more self-sufficient, we hope. Um, IP will be less frightening to people with little technical skill, we hope. Um, renewed focus on failover, redundancy and backup, for the same reasons, talent is not gonna necessarily be able to troubleshoot um, uh, from a remote location. Um, IP connectivity is absolutely essential. And we think that analog technology is gonna go away. It's not as capable as AOIP in adapting to other, another pandemic type situation. Um, office studio newsroom configurations will change. They're, they're gonna consolidate and PPE will be everywhere. So really kind of the bottom line here is that we're gonna benefit from this experience, but you all deserve a, a huge attaboy, pat on the back for what you've accomplished over the last 18 months. So um, with that, Jake, can you go to the next page? This is, if you, I put together a, um, the resources to, that we use to make this presentation, if you want, ever wanted to, look at that uh, or do some of your own research. But most of all, we just wanna say thank you for having us. And uh, with that, we'll, 
open it up for questions. And I think there are a couple in the chat. How can I clear this? Sorry, yes, the, there is uh, at least one from Ray Lewis. Um, it's a comment and kind of a question. Uh, he's saying in the chat, our biggest issue is the stability of using public Wi-Fi. Uh, often not um, much we can do about this. Also, getting around firewalls during setup can be an issue. I think Thailand uses their own network for codec interconnectivity um, or interconnect. Um, so to address a couple of things, yeah, public Wi-Fi is definitely going to probably be your biggest hurdle. Um, when using a network like a uh, public Wi-Fi system that the city offers or like Starbucks, uh, McDonald's, you name it, those types of public Wi-Fi infrastructures, I typically always say use that as a last resort because you don't know what's going to happen on it. If McDonald's, if you're doing a remote, let's say at Starbucks or McDonald's, and they offer a staff Wi-Fi and a guest Wi-Fi, if you are doing a paid remote there, most likely that owner or that manager will probably give you access to the staff Wi-Fi if you ask. Um, you definitely want to be vocal about that. Don't just jump right onto the first available public Wi-Fi when you're doing these paid remote events. Try to get onto their private Wi-Fi network. It's probably going to be a little bit more stable and more robust, um, first and foremost. Um, now, if you are running into that issue of using a public Wi-Fi and that's the only option you have, um, or at least that's relatively available to you right there at a moment's notice um, that you see, something that a lot of people do tend to forget is most modern codecs can also tether from your phone. So if you have an iPhone or an Android, that's a second internet connection right there, right out of the gate. You could utilize that, plug in and get connected right back to the sta uh, station using two network connections. If you have more modern equipment for like network redundancy. So you could utilize and leverage the public Wi-Fi plus your own LTE hotspot off your phone or the tethered connection off your phone. Um, so you do have a little bit or some ways of getting a more robust and more reliable connection back to the studio. I wanted to give Josh a little bit of a, a, a plug. You could use Max Connect. Um, yes. Well. And it, once you bring in Max Connect, to be honest, and again, this is, yeah, giving Josh another plug, we can't recommend that service enough to our clients. Um, we have integrated LTE modules for our hardware products, uh, like this little guy, if you can see it here. This works with two carriers. Get a Max Connect AT&T, Max Connect Verizon. You now have public static IPs that are routable to this card to your field equipment. So now you have that remote access. Then you also get quality of service or uh, a prioritized network on his uh, system. So you get a much better experience in the long run. Um, so that's one way you could actually just bring your own internet to the, the remote is have the internet connectivity embedded in your remote hardware already ready to go. Now, in terms of your comment or question about uh, does Tyline use our own infrastructure or backbone to interconnect our codecs? The answer is actually no, we do not. And the reason for this is because Tyline and the ownership of Tyline, they're big believers of low latency audio. To achieve low latency audio, we need to have a point-to-point -point system. As soon as we start introducing proxy servers or server hops in the middle to help interconnect everything, latency does increase. Now that doesn't mean that we don't offer some sort of network service that can help you broker those connections. So we do offer what we call a traversal server with our like uh, the Tyline Via, Genies, Merlins, and then soon to be the Gateway. Um, that actually allows you to help broker and break through NATs um, or network address translators, essentially, aka a pseudo firewall, if you will, or somewhat of a firewall. It doesn't work on every type of firewall, depending on how you have the firewall configured. So those very strict NATs that like universities, for instance, a traversal server may not work for you where you might still need port forwarding, but on a home network infrastructure, chances of that talent taking their time and configuring their router to a very, very specific configuration that will not work with a traversal server is rare. Um, so you're gonna have more success with a traversal server than you would having uh, with a proxy server because a proxy service is now gonna essentially delay that audio just a little bit 
how much is dependent on that service, um, but we do not do that here. We believe in low latency audio as low latency as possible. Um, and with our hardware, we can achieve down to 10 to 20 milliseconds in an ideal network configuration. Um, so we definitely do have uh, the advantages there um, with having that. Now, something else to note about our connectivity um, is that uh, typically only one end of the link does require firewall management. That's typically the uh, link that's going to receive the connection or receive the call. That's typically the only thing that does require firewall management, unless you want remote access to that remote Kodak. Um, so if you do want to be able to control that home studio, you might have to actually go um, and do some port forwarding. Now, um, and, and Ray, I hope that answers your questions um, with that. And let me, please let me know if it doesn't, if you do want to have a much more in-depth conversation about firewalls and how we can work over that, definitely let us know. Um, but, but that's kind of the gist is that we, we don't have to have a lot of firewall management. It's more ideal for remote management um, if you want to go that route. Um, right, now, so Tim's got a question. Um, yeah. Is there any chance of a smartphone app that allows connection to the Tyline products without a subscription? Yes, uh, it's actually the very first Tyline app we ever created. Uh, it's called Report It Live. Uh, it was introduced in 2009 um, and it's had a couple of different price points throughout the year. Um, it is a standalone app in the iPhone app store only. Um, and the reason for this is because we are a big believer in iPhones and the iOS platform versus the Android platform. You'll note our subscription service does offer Android, and that's because the market has driven it to the Android support, where our freelance model, the Report It Live model, is a standalone. Uh, essentially, it's a pay per hour service, but there is a standalone pay for it once, you never have to pay for it again. It typically costs right around $300 for that installation. It works only once, uh, or I should say this, it only allows for a single install um, and it can be used forever in that installation. It follows Apple's policy. Um, so it is transferable. So you can transfer it to new phones, but it's only good for one device at a time uh, per Apple's policy. So it is definitely doable. And if you want more info, uh, Tim, just email Doug or I, and uh, we can uh, set you up with uh, where you can go and get, uh, get access to that uh, application. Thanks, guys. I, I read an interesting article. You might want to comment about it. I read yesterday that some the, the guy was talking about the title of his uh, article was uh, trash can audio and he was referring to uh television stations mainly where they have moved to the uh remote operation from their home and they don't pay a whole lot of attention to the acoustics of where they're actually doing their their reporting uh, you might comment on that if you will yeah, if you if you saw some of the photos on on in this presentation, there were guys in the closet. Uh, um, I've seen pictures of of um, very elaborate uh, acoustical setups using plastic and whatnot um, to shield for germs and uh, also for sound. Jake, what have you what have, what, are you, what are your comments on that? Yeah, well, the very first thing I ever saw a picture of during this pandemic was uh, the closet example. Somebody sent me a photo of somebody using a tie line via in a closet, in a walk-in closet with clothes surrounding them, dresses, uh, pants, suits, etc. Um, that was a little strange at first just seeing that. But then once I started thinking about it, I was like, oh, well, it makes sense, the acoustics. Um, so we've seen a lot of things like that. Um, it doesn't shock me that the TV industries had to go down that same road. In fact, some of our TV clients who uh, mainly focus on TV but use our equipment for low latency IFBs and for higher fidelity audio, that's not embedded in the video feed itself. Um, those clients have even talked about how they're having to really kick up and drive up the compression um, on, in some areas because there's just a lot of background noise they have to comp 
compensate for. And others have said they've had to send uh, soundproof panels before. Just a few that they can put a, just a little bit around the microphone itself. So all they care about is the mic or the audio feed in some cases. Um, but the video feed's secondary for them in, again, certain applications. Um, but yeah, it doesn't shock me at all that TV is struggling in the same aspect with audio uh, that radio would be. Um, because trying to do it from home in a environment that's not built for soundproofing, you're going to get a, a wide range of different uh, um, audio artifacts, if you will. Um, whether it's a little bit of uh, the EMS or EMTs driving by or uh, the dog barking out back, um, mm -hmm. you're going to get it. It's inevitable in a non studio essentially or in a non-studio environment and, and larry that falls under the category of over time we will make this better um because it sounds bad um mm -hmm. it uh, you know it, it's cute in the beginning sloppy if you let it go too long um you know so i think with i think the only thing that might be holding that back might be budget um and we're seeing a lot of that um that uh uh, infrastructure, it, you know, cap, CapEx stuff has been kind of put on hold in a lot of cases until everybody kind of feels a little bit better. So they're not, they're, they're buying the, the better home setups slowly, but surely. So that eventually the trash can effect will likely go away. Yeah. I, I actually asked an engineer at a TV station uh, not too long ago. I, I got to noticing that, uh, <clears throat> that when they do a news story or they do a package, they go out in the field and shoot something and they do a, a wraparound to open up the package. The audio is so much different on the opening and the closing. It, it sounded like they were, it was done in a, in a shower stall or something. <laughs> and I asked them about, it. they said, yeah, I said they edit those things sometimes in the field or on the car when they're coming back to the station or stuff like that. And I said, well, it, there's so much difference in the audio. It seems like, and I, I worked in television for many years, but it seems like television people pay more attention to video than they do audio in some cases. And they that let that slide. So mm -hmm. uh, I agree with you. Yeah. Oh yeah. And the, well, thing, you know, the thing is that we're getting used to it. So it's, it doesn't look as strange anymore, but you know, the, it, on TV, you're less likely, I think, to switch channels uh, than you are with radio. Um, yeah, that's true. <laughs> it's all, you, know, you know, if you like your personalities on TV, and you want to get up. You know. Okay, well, we appreciate you guys being with us. Uh, did you have your... Uh, Before we go. Got to, pull out of the box here. Out of the I, don't, hat I don't have a hat, so I'm just going to pull one from Okay. this little thing here. And the winner is Tim Lieber. Is Tim still with us? I don't think so. Hold on. We're going to keep drawing until we have a, a live winner. Larry Wilkins. Larry, you, you're, you're, the, you're the winner today. Oh, I am? <laughs> you're the winner. <laughs> oh. There it is. Wait. Well, okay. how did I do that? <laughs> okay. So, Larry, I've got your email address. I'll, I'll send you. It'll, you'll, it'll come uh, via uh, email. Okay. Uh, thing you could take to use on amazon so all right good we, we appreciate uh, the information and if anybody on the on the uh, webinar has any more questions i'm sure they can uh, uh they can get with you guys and uh and uh, you can answer the questions without without any problem absolutely we'll, yep. thank you for having us yeah okay. thank you guys so much and we'll uh have another program uh, let me get my um uh I'm actually on the wrong slide here. I'm sorry. <laughs> Get over here. Our, our next uh, uh, call will actually be on November the 16th. So mark your calendar for that uh, starting at 10 o'clock uh, uh, Central Time on November the 16th will be our next webinar. Thank you everybody for attending and we'll see you again in uh, November.